and thanks for being here. This is SJ Anderson. I'm really happy to be with you tonight where I am and today wherever you are, wherever you are in the world to talk about this solar eclipse in Libra, major, major solar eclipse moment. I made, you know, eclipse seasons are major peaks every year. They're peaks of, uh, in within our reality. And so it's wonderful to be interactive and just be in this space with you and get to share this kind of with some collective energy. I think it's very Libra, uh, Libra solar eclipse that we're in a kind of collective moment. Hey, everyone. Hey, Sam. Uh, thanks, Diana. Thanks for uh, being able to hear me. Um, and so what I'm going to do is just kind of my normal video, but it's just going to be live and we're just going to start in. Uh, I want to kick it off by noting that we're in this uh, long Hellenistic void, of course, moon. Uh, this started when the moon uh, opposed Venus, and, and then there's a 45 degree and 14 degree minute uh, void, of course, period that will end when the moon sextiles Saturn uh, after the eclipse, actually, on the 28th. And so we're in this kind of uh, liminal realm where this is not the Leo King of the Gothic topic. No, no, no. Uh, this is SJ Anderson. I think that's probably, yeah, there's your tongue out emoji. No, this is SJ. Hi, welcome here. Hey, everyone, what's going on? Yeah, I'm happy to be doing it. GG, really cool to be here. But, you know, Hel Hellenistic board, of course, I mean, these are very rare. It's when the moon uh, spins a whole 30 degrees without making any kind of aspect. And some people are a little bit more freaked out, like in the contemporary scene, like Hellenist, like avoid, of course, moon. Oh, no, can't do anything. I kind of like them because I think we're in some sort of liminal space where there's a pause. There's never anything like this where the moon isn't hitting other planets, but we have it now and we have this eclipse. And so it can be kind of a, I don't know, spiritual abeyance, rare opportunity, you know, maybe break through the veil of some kind. I always call eclipses glitches in the matrix or recently I have been, there's a film by Rodney Asher called glitch in the matrix. Some of you may have seen it, but it's all about the idea that we may be in some kind of matrix. And I think astrology might be confirmation of that. I think it might be a divine matrix. Anyhow, I'm, get, I'm already riffing and getting way off course. So, you know, just know that if you're looking for this weekend, I think it's a major a priority period to rest. It's definitely an eclipse style rest, but also this long void, of course, moon. So, okay, let me, let me, uh, move on. The first slide, this is the slide. We're going to start here with the Libra solar eclipse. Look at the chart. I want to focus mainly on this this first point is that Libra, what is Libra? Because that's where the action happens. You know, that's where the eclipse takes place. It's the locus of the eclipse. And so we really need to dig in. I mean, it's sometimes a good first step with anything. What's the sinology? I've actually become more and more into sinology um, lately. I know it might sound strange. You know, a lot of times there's disdain for, for that with like traditional astrologers. But I think sinology has this kind of great power because I won't go into all that here, but when you when you look at Libra, the thing is to understand Libra, you're you're bringing in the rulership, and so you're back to traditional techniques and ancient techniques to get into sinology. And when we think about Libra, we're dealing with you know the harmony seeking equilibrium of justice. These are the kind of uh, Saturnine features where you have a uh, bottom, a foundation. If you've ever built a house or anybody's in, been in construction, you know you have to level a foundation, and that's what Saturn as the exaltation lord of Libra is. It's a leveler. And so you really do want to find that those ba that balance point. It's also if you built foundations, when you pour the concrete, you have to um, you use these tools to make it look pretty. So there's like a Venus Saturn component to the house building, your house building with Libra. There's something foundational. After all, it is a cardinal sign. And that's going to become a key here as we talk about this topic. Let's see. I'm not looking at my chart here. Um, let me make sure it looks like the screen share. Um, let me see. Can you see the chart, everyone? Um, can you see the chart? Let's see. Um, are you able to see the chart of the eclipse? I'm not seeing that in my. Um, let me see. I, I, I hope I hope I guess you can't. I don't know. Someone tell me here. Um, I apologize for this. I'm just I really want to make sure that you can see it and got it. Love your riffs. Thank you. We have preliminary elections in, okay, I'm going to check my other window. Pardon me, I, I wanted to keep going. Yes, you're seeing the chart. Okay, good. My phone is not is showing an old screen. So good. So here's the chart. I'm going to just make sure you can see these slides. Anyhow, you got this leveling, this leveling of uh, this Libra. It's balance. You're seeking balance with Libra. You're seeking foundation stability through relational and kind of seriousification of the relational, you might say. And it's outer world. It's an air sign. So we're looking at like stated uh, agreements, things th that are about the material world around us. Um, and so 
it, it, there's something about intellectualism with an air sign as well. Like you don't actually feel into agreements here in Libra. That might be more Taurian or like, how are we feeling or scorpionic? I, you know, I, I want to be close to you because I care for you. And, you know, this is less feeling and it, or it can be some of that, but I mean, it's more of like the intellect, like what makes sense? Let's think this through. Let's plan the life together. Let's decide if we're compatible through some kind of more systematized. It sounds boring, doesn't it? Right. You know, sometimes Libra can get the rap. Thank you, uh, Michelle, for the compliment. Um, sometimes you get, uh, you know, um, bored a little bit because you have to pause and more intellectualize some of the relational characteristics in Libra. But that, that's the great thing about it. You know, using discernment, objectivity, trying to make good decisions, everybody on the same page kind of stuff. Um, but that's all eclipsed. This is the first main point. All of that gets eclipsed. And so these ideas of what's level, what's fair, what's objective, what's unifying, what are we going to agree upon? There's something in, in this moment where that's blocked. And that's what an eclipse is. One luminary uh, or the earth blocks the other luminary. You might rephrase it differently. The luminaries can't, the, uh, the, the syzygy, which is a three points um, uh, and their alignment, the syzygy, the syzygy blocks out light. Is it may be just a way to say it. And so with built into the symbolism of the eclipse is kind of like, all right, what we thought would work is blocked. And now we're having to kind of go on and adapt onto the on the fly, you might say. But around this theme, social cohesion, relationships, you know, what is equilibrium? What is the harmony that we're trying to seek? Now, I'm going to do this here because I know a lot of people want to talk about this topic and I want to just kind of get it out of, of the way. Very quickly, this is not a video about that, but you know, trigger warning. Uh, we're going to talk about the news. We're going to talk about the obvious headline here. We have to, um, and that's the Palestine-Israel war or Gaza-Israel war that's just erupted. I'm going to only spend briefly a few moments on it, but I think it's 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 something we really have to talk about because it's an example of this first point I made that the concordance, the agreement, the stasis, the stated kind of way of being in a relationship is under pressure, it's eclipsed. And if you go to the nativity of the nation, uh, nation Israel, this is a chart from 14 May, 1948. This is the chart Dr. Nick Campion uses. He is the probably the best living astrologer that there is, Dr. Nick Campion, or one of them, there's a handful, seminal books he's written. One of his books is about um, nativities of countries. And it's just a compendium where he lists every possible country and every possible natal chart. This is the chart he uses for Israel, look where that ascendant is, 23 degrees, two degree minutes, Libra, right here. And so we're having an eclipse two degrees over, less than two degrees over. And so right away, I mean, you don't really need any more than that, right? The ascendant of the nation is eclipsed. And, 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 it's, and this war erupts as this eclipse is building with the sun already in the sign of Libra. Uh, there were some debates on Twitter, like, well, uh, it, it's not about the eclipse, because the eclipse didn't hit yet. Well, you know, we're right sun in the sign where it's about to be eclipsed. I, I can uh, consider that eclipse season sun co-present with Ketu or the south node of the moon. It's about this eclipse. And as we peek into the weekend of this eclipse, we can already see that, you know, what happened was, and I'm going to show you this next slide, um, you had a Mars-Ketu conjunction exact squaring Pluto by about three degrees. So that's the ascendant, right? A degree off the ascendant of the Israel chart. This is Sally Robin at Astro Mundane on X Twitter. And that was that square, that Pluto-Mars square with Ketu triggers the uh, nativity uh, in the Israel chart. And boom, we, we have exploded now into a really a crisis, a, a major global crisis of concordance, of law, which is Libra, of equilibrium. All of those previous structures have now been basically uh, turned on their head. And this is this is what can be a stand-in for, I'm going to come here in a second, we're going to break it more down in our personal lives and, and what's going on there. We can use this kind of as a metaphor, because we might have had other, like our own relational sort of inversions that we might be struggling with some of you out there. I know I'm seeing it with a lot of people. So um, the last thing I want to say, you know, if you, you know, astrologers, it's like, say something, say something. This is really the take that I thought was the best take. This is by X copy, the crypto artist. And he's a great uh, kind of one of the most important digital artists in the crypto space. And he just says, I oppose the murder of both Palestinian and Israeli civilians, especially children. This couldn't be a controversial take. That's what I sort of I just wanted to share that because part of what's going to happen after the eclipse, part of what will happen is that um, you have to rebuild. Right. The ability to make agreements is eclipsed here. So in this eclipse moment, it'll be like I can't do anything. Right. The agreements are blocked. Crisis. 
but you'll learn in like negotiation one-on-one if you've ever studied that i've taken some courses on it uh, in college there is this idea that you can try to find common ground as a starting place for concordance and this i feel like can be a great starting uh, ground and you know innocent uh, civilians should not be killed you know and especially children so anyhow i just wanted to say that just so we're you know that can be brought in i don't want to be insensitive the other thing is that I'm about to release a long talk on um, this channel. The conference has asked me to wait until I, comments are not showing. Maybe there isn't any comments, but I'm they're not. I'm not seeing any more on my phone, so I don't know if there probably is some, and they're just for whatever reason not loading. Let me try to uh, refresh this somehow, and um, let's see I'm here. Close. No, no comments. Okay, no pressure to comment at all. I'm glad there's there's. I think we're we're caught up on those. But this was the talk I gave for Skyscript. Um, that was this online mundane astrology conference for, and they had uh, representatives from all over the world. Some really cool astrologers. I was really honored to get to speak on this. You know, at this event, I would I did a long presentation about the these. Part of it was about all of these eclipses and the mundane astrology for the United States. So they're allowing me to release it on first of November. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for for confirming that Mars fifty four. Um, you you know, and so look for that because I I didn't we I when I made this talk I had no idea that it was going to be a Middle Eastern. Um, situation that's a part of this narrative of course it's obvious because that's a major hot spot on the globe of like the handful of hot spots that are out there but just know that on one november you can come to the channel that's going to be here for you and there is a whole long detailed talk on the, this mundane astrology i also want to say part of that talk and what i tweeted out here was that and this is my kind of core here of all spiritual practices that i've practiced in my lifetime um is meta you know i've had many spiritual crises in my lifetime you know i've i've you know just on my you know hands and knees god help me you know this like deep and you know profound dark night to the soul but the one practice that has always been there for me ever since i learned it i learned it in uh, marin county back a long time ago but meta meta sutta uh, theravada buddhism and the meta uh spiritual practice and um, in that talk that I'm going to release from Skyscript, I have a whole section about spiritual preparation, because that's, to me, one of the most important things for this time that we're entering into, this very dynamic time. But I just want to say that here, because it's so charged out there, and there's a lot of just sadness and grief and fear and anxiety, and rightfully so. I mean, it's really intense out there, you know, but this practice is so beautiful because it really just goes to the core of these phrases that you say. And that's what this is. It's may all beings be happy. May all beings, this is the translation, may they be joyous and live in safety. All be, all living beings, whether weak or strong, in high or middle or low realms of existence, small or great, visible or invisible, near or far, born or to be born, may all beings be happy. And that, if you just say that uh, three minutes a day, every day for like 30 days, it will can change your whole life. It can open your heart and just revolutionize your capacity to love. And I just, I feel like it's an obligation. I'll probably be talking more about this. Um, yeah, I did. It was a beautiful place. I was lucky to have been up in Marin County with, there's some uh, retreat centers up there. I was, you know, had the great fortune of getting to spend some time there in, in silence, um, uh, several last decade let's, uh, in the in the aughts, <laughs> but, um, or that's two decades ago now. Wow, time flies. So anyhow, I just want to let's pivot now. Okay, let's come back into the astrology. But I just feel like it's ethical for me. I'm just feeling more drawn to share a little bit of this context because this is how I'm processing these matters. And it's very real. I mean, this isn't like just an entertaining game, you know. I mean, the astrology, you saw that chart. I mean, it was an exact trigger of the ascendant, Mars Pluto Ketu, the most difficult and deeply triggering, uh, you know, symbols we have. And reality is unfolding in this deeply you know, um, kind of like strap in and we're all on for a ride. And so we have to talk about how we're navigating psychically and spiritually. Um, let me see. It doesn't seem that the Astro supports rational response at the moment. Thanks for providing a measured loving example. Yeah, th that's exactly right. The Astro, that long void, of course, moon, I'm going to get into that actually. And there's, and so let's pivot now because I want to uh, come in here. When will it end? Okay. Uh, um, that's, I'm going to leave that for the skyscript talk. You know, people are like, well, when might these conflicts die down and everything? Just look at that talk. I'm hoping that like eclipse season will be over. 28 October is the lunar eclipse. You have um, Mars has just shifted signs. 
you know, Mars, Saturn square in November, that looks kind of rough. You know, I'm hoping for some, anyhow, I don't, I don't even want to conjecture. I think that you're wise, Alyssa, to, to share that there's no rational response. There actually isn't a rational response, except that oh, the heart, that's all I've, I've been able to come up with is trying to have the hearts, uh, a heart centered model. And, you know, um, knowing that there are cycles here, like we have Saturn and Pisces that ends in 2026. Actually, I'm going to table this conversation about when will it end. Just go to my talk because I actually really address it there, the one on November 1st. Okay, let's keep going. Um, so now I want to shift into more of the personalized side of this because the, the the mundane is the mundane, and that's you know that's what it is. But now let's come in like our personal lives. I've talked to some people where I am that aren't really as news driven and they're not really even thinking about the news. And that's kind of interesting that they have. And, the, and I'm seeing a lot of other people just having a lot of interpersonal climaxes right now. And, you know, I think sometimes my news silos and like astro mundane news silos, I can easily forget that there's these whole other ways of, of relating in reality. Um, but the first thing I'll say about this is that when we talk about alliances being under pressure, I mean, we have, we all have alliances, don't we? I mean, we have friends, we have uh, partners in our in our personal life. We have relationships, love relationships. You know, we have um, all kinds of people that we have have tacit or formal agreements with. And you might be finding, especially after a rejuvenated Venus, all that long Venus retrograde, Mars is now powerful for the first time. It's been powerful in a long time. I mean, there could be some real relational dynamics happening. And if that's happening for you, and, and in this moment of eclipse, maybe if you're struggling to maintain balance or processing the faded beginnings and endings or the transformations of this summer, uh, or even now with the eclipse in Libra Aries, that's normal for eclipses, you know, to have like intensely unpredictable, maybe shifts or alterations, you know, people pr uh, professing love or people kind of showing their true colors or true face or true you know, side of who they are. Um, I think it can be a great time for, and I want to shift here, uh, I mean, the second we're going to talk about Mercury, but this eclipses aren't always bad. I've been seeing tons and tons of chart examples recently. Uh, they're often actually quite amazing where, you know, the lunar node is involved or an eclipse and it, and it transforms someone in a really potent and powerful way. And so I think it's worth leaving space for that where like maybe there's a relationship shifting right now in your sphere and it's like really opening up the deep realities of the true nature of that relational dynamic where honesty might emerge or the necessity to speak or to try to articulate or even just to even if there's not agreements that can be made right now, just the like the a breakthrough around um, telling the truth or sharing an emotion or taking some kind of risk of intimacy out of necessity, because that's what happens with eclipses, like there's no way to hide kind of thing. And that can be quite profound and useful and transformative. So always hold space for, for that. Um, the next thing I just want to quickly say is that or actually just to put a final point on that, you know, it's like eclipses, struggles, intensity. Sometimes it's good to not engage. Sometimes you're forced to engage. And the spiritualization of reality, I think, is what's central. That can be a, K a Ketu a style uh, uh, model, which is uh, asceticism, withdrawal, and spirituality. It's been a big theme, certainly in my life as I do eclipses. I found myself meditating more recently just to try to, because there's nothing else to do, right? A lot of it's processing the news, but let's come back. Next slide. This is the, the powerful thing about the configurations. Look at it. So in traditional or ancient astrology, we have sign-based aspects from Ptolemy, and then we have um, something called aversion, and that's where uh, a sign, so Libra, no degree in Libra makes a Ptolemaic aspect to any degree in Scorpio. Maybe that's the way to say it for those of you that are more uh, uh, orb-based. been pretty brutal from personal to global. Yep, Mars 54. I mean, it has been, it's really one of those things like the Band-Aid gets ripped off. Uh, I think that might be an expression to use here. Uh, you know, one of those things where maybe you, you know, you know what I think with Libra um, and Aries and Mars and when the nodes are in Libra and Mar uh, Mars and Venus ruled signs is the I idea of relationships and like a breakup is an analogy that I want to throw in here. Let's say a breakup happened, you know, maybe someone broke up during Venus retrograde or something like that. A lot of those celebrity breakups, but then the Libra eclipse comes and you thought you had an agreement with the ex of like, this is the coffee shop I go to. That's the one you go to. And then you turn the corner, get your, to get your espresso and there's your ex. And it's like, oh, you get triggered. It's all back, you know, the, and, but, but that's good, you know, in, in a certain way that is because when you see that it's like all that emotion 
it's still there. It's like, and so it's like, all right, you can go back home and feel the emotion, feel like, let it run through us. Yeah, let it, you know, integrate at a more deeper level. So it's like these triggers that can sometimes, you know, if, if one was in a different place, you see the ex is like, Hey, what's up normal. But when it's like a Libra eclipse and all of, and, and, you know, um, it can sometimes be the kind of triggers that are, that are really intensely challenged, but also healing. So, uh, let me see here. It doesn't seem natural. Okay. So let's just keep going, but you can see here. So Mars and Venus and Virgo and Scorpio, aversion, aversions to the luminaries. Okay. Uh, Saturn and Pisces, Jupiter and Taurus aversions to the luminaries. The only planet that's mixing with the luminaries is Mercury. And I think there's a message here about this comment uh, that uh, Alyssa made earlier about um, not really having an answer because Mercury's under the sun's beams. This can be our logic brain, uh, Mercury. And it might be time to just not like even search for an answer, like let the process happen here. On the other hand, you know, Mercury does have some dignity in Libra. And if, if the eclipse is happening at night where you are, so I think like Europe and Asia, Africa, Australia, you might find that you actually might be able to think a little bit here and use that Mercury as the one kind of tool that you can kind of dig in with. Maybe this is in its chariot. It's got some night triplicity rulership in Libra, and maybe this can assist um, I think, what did I have here in my notes? I had uh, uh, that Mercury as the night trigon lord underscores how important information, communication, and agreements are to Libra. And Mercury is language and written agreements. And so on the one hand, that could be part of what's being eclipsed. You know, it's like you promised you wouldn't come to this coffee shop. Now you're here. And now, you know, or or it's like, oh, we didn't we didn't talk about this park. And then you you run into someone in terms of like a breakup agreement or something like this. And, and so it's it's good to like realize like what are the details of the written agreements? What are the word promises that have been made? And that could be maybe part of what's being pressurized and wanting to be reconsidered. With Mercury there, Knight Trigon ruler of the luminaries and mixing with them. I think that's the maybe one way in here where we get some maybe direct engagement. It could be subtle, it could be you know not as clear with Mercury under the beams. Um, okay, let's keep shifting. I want to go to the next point. I want to point out here, Mars is in Scorpio. Look at that. Just happened. How did you all uh, do with Mars and Scorpio? Uh, I mean, I know for me, I was awake uh, a few hours before, and then, you know, I've been just having a really energized day, really uh, some better energy uh, for my week, you know, just enjoying music. I think that's that Mars, Venus uh, sextile that's back and just really enjoying some of that musical side venus rule look what venus rules right now in the sky it rules every planet it rules exaltation um saturn the exo uh, venus is the exaltation lord of pisces domicile lord of taurus so it rules jupiter venus rules libra by domicile and by um night triplicity it rules scorpio so venus has some dominion over everything in the sky right now everything and music is Venus. And I wonder how much there's th th those of you that are musical, playing music, singing, I've been doing some of that, really feels good just to hear the uh, vibrations of the vocal cords. And that's a Virgo and Venus model too, by the way. Virgo is the body. There's a real bodily component. It's the earth sign. The moon has dominion over Virgo. You know, you hum or sing, or even if you're doing those meditations, I was suggesting someone on uh, X Twitter was saying like, Om Mani Padme Hum. You know, this these are really powerful grounding and it's not logical you know you have the logic of libra but then the non-logical sometimes of virgo it's where it's more like paying attention and feeling into a bodily sensation and then you bring it back in with mercury and libra and you might be able to kind of take some notation and there is that exchange of signs here and so there might be something about the no notation or the attention formation around music singing or voicing you know, um, what is the Terrence McKenna thing? The great uh, play, uh, uh, Susan, yeah, um, that's beautiful. I, I really, it was this morning, music just, I listened to it a lot, but I was playing some older tunes. That's a, something I would suggest as well. Like we all have songs that are our favorites that when you put them on, it, it can lift the spirits, you know, and that could be, or songs that you like to play. So maybe one strategy here. Part of it, I think, is like Venus sextile Mars, the planet of action, strong in Virgo, or strong in Scorpio. This this might help us be able to be a little more active right now, especially after Ketu, uh, Mars Ketu conjunction in Mars and Libra. And then it's the sextile, the overcoming sextile from Venus is like active with music as it, as maybe a way or one part of the uh, energy. J. Sue Joy of Man's Desiring, love it, love it. Blues, I've been listening to blues, um, 
uh, Nyatanchi. I've been listening. I was listening to some Muddy Waters, actually. Um, uh, John the Conqueror Root. I don't know if you've heard that song. I uh, love that song. Um, but uh, that came in just through some conversations and just listening. Yeah, it's it's just the music is it's visceral and it and it's not intellectual. Men, McKenna, yes, what I was going to say about McKenna um, is that he says that when you have these bad trips, which I think that could be a something to think about. Eclipses can be trippy. We're kind of in a bad trip, aren't we? The collective energy just went bad a little bit this week. And he says you can sing your way out of a bad trip. And there's there's lectures where he talks about being so like in the depths of a psychedelic experience and he just starts singing out of it. Um, I, that's not an advocacy for psychedelics. I think if you do do that, you know, get to train professionals that can be uh, have a safe container for you around set and setting. So just to be clear, um, let's see here. Not even listening to much Astro. Yep. It's heavy. I know it's it's just it's it's all heavy, you know, and I think that's why there's a lot of art in this talk. Because this this is an artistic moment, and it's Venus ruling everything. And Venus was strong in Virgo, with day triplicity in Virgo, and it's day triplicity in Scorpio. I said night triplicity earlier. Venus rules all so-called feminine signs, earth and water signs, by day triplicity. And so that is, um, but you know, there's this. It's very powerful. Venus rules both eclipses, and it's ruling every planet. And I think that this is this is sometimes the Venusian is like a great outlet member of Venus is unity, pleasure and and, you know, basically beauty, you know, beauty makes cr us cry. I mean, I'm touched by beauty, you know, when you see something so beautiful or even when you just see like you know, love, you know, love is is touching. And I think there might be some of that if you can find examples of like love. And I mean, it could be anything like you know, someone helps someone up off the street or, you know, any kind of just love that it's in your life. That's where I would try to focus now. Um, okay, let me shift here. Oh, quick, I just want to say about the Scorpio Mars. Let me just come to the next slide. Oh, I had another slide here about aversion. Um, and this is a slide that is about, uh, let me see here. The definition of aversion, I uh, uh, X this or tweeted this out. This is just an English language definition. So plain language, not astrological, but it's the avoidance of a thing or a situation that has been associated with unpleasant or painful stimulus. And so you have all those planets that are avoiding kind of the matter. And that's why what you, your comment earlier, Alyssa, was like, um, it's not, we don't even kind of know how to process or it's not time or it's just, it's confusion. It's hard to reach conclusions. I think it's just, there's a lot of unpleasant stuff. And I think it's like leaning into the aversions, maybe one strategy. I think it's okay to acknowledge aversions. Remember what it's, you know, it's not just, oh, aversion, bad. No, it's like, okay, aversion. And what does that then signify? And in our astrological system, aversions signify the averse houses to the ascendant. So you can lean into 12th house topics. 12th house is the house of retreat. And if you go back to the um, you go back to the chart here, what's in the twelfth house from Libra? Twelfth from Libra, derived houses from the uh, solar chart of the eclipse. It's Venus in the twelfth, retreating into your creative powers, into your singing, and so that is a way to just deal with aversions. I, I think it's it brings us into topics. So Saturn in the sixth, at processing the eclipse through some of the like leaning into the structure like your alarm clock goes off at the same time you make your breakfast at the same time i remember growing up my dad always ate cereal in the morning every morning he had the cereal and the milk it was like every morning and it really helped me have you know i have my attachment issues or whatever but that that was one of the good things about my childhood to have you know that consistency of that daily routine and that rigor of the daily grind of life and that saturnine energetic but you can see here how we can delineate these aversions there, it's not just, it's like aversion abandoned. No, there's always symbolic depth to every energetic. And so, okay, let me come back. But the, the point that I just wanted to say is that it's painful right now. And it's okay to avoid through things like retreating into music or, you know, our daily rhythms or something like this, like, like deliberate kind of strategic self-care, really. It's self-care to to acknowledge an aversion and to embrace it so okay let me keep shifting next slide this is what i was thinking was next you've got the mars and scorpio timetable and i just want to point this out this was a tweet that i think a lot of people resonated with mars was in scorpio 19 november 2019 3 january 2020 mars then came into scorpio next 3 october 2021 13 december 2021 you might want to check in the, to those dates for your Scorpio story right now, um, just kind of quickly look back and touch base with your life there. And I, I could show show more. I had a little bit more of a write up here. 
I find this was interesting. It was kind of right before the COVID crisis arrived in the beginning of 2020. We had a nice Mars in Scorpio. And then this was right before the Ukraine crisis. So from a mundane perspective, Mars and Scorpio actually was kind of a the last period of stasis. Um, and so if that's the case, you know, I think it's, you know, it's worth just keeping in mind, you know, if things kind of get more sh uh, shifting around when Mars enters um, Sagittarius in November, that's more mutation. Right now we have a fixed Mars and that might be good for somehow some kind of relative stasis when we look back for this period. So, okay, let me just, uh, and then the last thing I want to say is 22 October, Mercury enters Scorpio, 23 October, Sun enters Scorpio. And so uh, we're looking at 10 or 11 days from now, it's a Scorpio stellium that arrives. So your Scorpio story is quite, quite important right now. And it's worth considering that story in your natal chart. The only thing I would tell you about that, go to your chart, find your rising sign. Okay. That's your first house. This is the whole sign house system. And then all you have to do is find what sign comprises Scorpio, just count it. So like if you're uh, ascendant is let's say Taurus let's just go for as an example well the sign opposite Taurus is Scorpio so it would be the seventh house themes and that's what you can consider right now as the Scorpio stellum stellium begins to pile up it's my favorite way just into the highest level of how you do a transit this is what I tell people on x twitter all the time they're like what does it mean for me I just say go to your what's the house let's start there that's about all I can do you know um uh, just in the replies there but okay let me shift now. Okay, I wanted to come to this. And this is so interesting to me, you know, because I wrote a whole talk on this. I prepare these like a week in advance. I'm always thinking about what kind of stuff I want to put in or talk about for a different, uh, you know, syzygy, new moon or full moon. Let me just check back in here. I want to see great video with Van Morrison on his blue influ blend influence, blues influence. Cool. I like Van Morrison. Um, let's see here. Mercury, Mars, co-presence in Virgo all throughout August that never really culminated. Yep. They didn't meet. They didn't perfect that aspect. Maybe with Venus now we're seeing some of those ideas. Yep. And I think it will culminate storm Aquarius conjunction of uh, Mars and Venus in February. That's when they finally meet after a lot. They haven't met uh, since the sextile. I think it was back in April, something like that. So we could be even waiting longer here for like some kind of final relation or resolution. If there's some kind of relationship dramas, um, let's see here. You're listening to music, trying not to get you. Yeah, I love that. Uh, music has been such a cool outlet. Thank you. Let me see. You came in late. Sounds like maybe a good show or play, play on your channel. Yeah, play on the channel. I'm going to kind of edit this out and make it a little bit nicer. So, uh, meta prayer, always good. Absolutely. Salute to the lesser of the thing. Absolutely. Salute to Venus. Thank you, Beth. Um, let's see here. The Icarius, a traditional planet ceremony. I, I, I'm not sure what that is, uh, Razorcia, but I'm interested to learn more. Uh, artist state with my guitar tomorrow. Wonderful. Soulbird's Nest. Love it. Love it. Love it. Um, Ukraine war detached. Yeah. And that's something good to know. I mean, we're, we've been dealing a lot with like intense collective mundane issues since 2020. I mean, even you go back before. And I think, you know, hopefully we can grow in our powers to like not uh, bypass. You know, a lot of times you hear about spiritual bypass. I don't think that's the approach. Uh, but at the same time, not um, lose our uh, core heart centered spiritual truth about our beingness, right? Our beingness. I love the idea of human be or being. We actually, it's a, it's a verb that is, you know, the ING form. It's a continuous and ongoing state and it's heart centered beingness, which is the core of the reality. And I think we have to, you know, we're having now as things get really wild with the mundane, we're getting hopefully more and more practice. I hope, I hope, because I think we're going to need it. Uh, let's see here. Let's see here. Um, cool, cool, cool. Time for evolution. Yep. Going to have to evolve. Um, I'm optimistic. There's a whole thing later. I'm just really trying to stay hopeful for humanity and optimistic. I mean, what other choice do we have? Um, okay. So yeah, this astronomical versus astrological. Uh, I... You know, Tara, that is a whole conversation. Uh, we don't do literal sign. I mean, that's one uh, zodiac called the constellational zodiac. That it's, it's a whole conversation. Just Google. You type this into your search engine: constellational zodiac versus sidereal zodiac versus tropical zodiac, and you'll get some answers on that. Uh, traditional ancient astrology uses a tropical zodiac base, goes all the way back to Babylon, and it's a thirty-degree division idealized of the ecliptic of the sun. It just uses the names of the constellations, but that has nothing to do with the constellations, the division. Okay, it's about the solar lunal. It's a solar solar relationship to the Earth. All right, 
Uh, Mars trying Saturn is so powerful. Yep, release and surrender. Okay, thank you, love and light, uh, MT. Appreciate that, love and light, back to you. Okay, this is the thing. I had a whole thing on the talk about the Treaty of Versailles. That was the what I wanted to go into about the Libra eclipse, how that's eclipsed. We try to make an agreement, but it can't quite work, or the deeper foundational roots of it somehow aren't addressed. And this was before the stuff in uh, Gaza and Israel. And so I, I don't really want to say much on it, except it's a great example. It says that um, the post-war reality began to diverge sharply from the ide idealistic vision. And if you read this article, I don't have any, this is, I mean, this is known basic history that people blame this agreement for basically not being structured properly or being too, you no, know, not taking into, into account realities. And it, and it kind of set up according to some historians World War II, because it, it the World War I Treaty of Versailles was not, you know, um, addressing kind of the the reality, you might say, on the ground. That's what's happening. And then, and then so I, I wrote this talk, and then this world situation uh, emerges, and I'm not going to go into it too much more, but you can just type in like Israel-Palestine solution to my news browser. And, it, and, you know, you're now talking about all of these legal issues and like previous agreements and you know, it goes back to, and some of you are experts on it, but, you know, I'm not going to, I'm just going to get off this really fast, but it's basically all kinds of legalisms and international law that is sort of the origins, at least of the modern day crisis. And and we're now seeing with the node in Libra, and that's Israel's ascendant, it's like triggering up the deeper root rootedness of those past crises. By the way, right before this talk, I looked up the beginning of World War II, at least what we mark it historically. It's 1 September 1939. The lunar, the true lunar nodes were at zero Taurus, zero um, Scorpio that day. And so they ingressed within days of the start of World War II into Libra um, Aries. And, and so you're seeing this idea of cardinal eclipses, particularly in Libra Aries, as like, what is the agreement? What is the kind of resistance to the agreement? Libra Aries. And then the kind of deep realities are triggered. And I think that's really what we're seeing now. Again, this is an example. And I'm just going to shift out of this. This was some more news uh, stories. What is the conflict about? The origin. I kind of like to research and try to figure out some of the, like the history of things. Um, solutions and history, three-state solution, two-state solution. These are like legal intellectual Libran models for how people are describing it. Okay. And again, come to this talk first November on my YouTube channel. I'll release it. It's about an hour long. It's a, it's, I, I put a lot into this and there's just a lot of slides and a lot of information. Okay. Now I want to shift to this whole other part of the talk. I did a little bit of it earlier when I just, it opened up this whole Venus music thing. But I was really kind of have a whole section here about Venus and Saturn. The reason why this is so important, Venus and Virgo opposite Saturn and Pisces, is that they are the two ruling planets of Libra, the, you know, the main rulers, you might say. I think trigon lords are just as important, but uh, oftentimes you'll see astrologer center, domicile and, and uh, exaltation lords. But you see it here. Those two, the uh, exaltation lord of Libra and Pisces, the domicile lord of Libra in Virgo, and they're opposing each other. And so I want to talk a little bit about Venus and Virgo and Saturn and Pisces as a kind of major signature at the moment. And then Jupiter sextiling Saturn and trining Venus as a real outlet here of kind of some hope. You know, Jupiter's doing a lot of heavy lifting here by aspect to the rulers of the eclipse sign and the eclipsed luminaries. And so what I want to focus on is just what we think about Venus and Virgo, detail orientation, right? Uh, getting into the meticulousness of the creativity. Sometimes people think, well, this is um, a buzzkill. I don't want to go over the, it's the Stanley Kubrick, classic Stanley Kubrick. I wish I had his nativity, but like the hundred takes, you do a hundred takes of a scene and the actors are like, why am I doing this over and over and over? But you watch his films and the editing, I mean, you see why you do a hundred takes, you get these powerful, you know, um, precise uh shots and and scenes as they unfold you know there's sometimes you can only get certain beauty through the virgoan uh poets are a great example line by line does the comma go here here and you go back and forth for 100 drafts and it's that one little comma or period this is all the venus and virgo leonard cohen with venus and virgo is a great example of a poet that has this energy um but that's opposing this unknown right? The unknown country, the unknown seas of Saturn and Pisces, the great wide expanse of where am I who, you know, where's the boundary? 
Saturn is the boundaries and you're in the great washed unknown mutable water sign. And so I think there's something where we try to go into our detail or trying to edit the poem and we just can't edit it. You know, we try to edit the poem and it's like, it's just, it's not really working. And, you know, sometimes if you're editing writing and you just start writing more paragraphs or more is coming out. And that's how this moment feels where it's almost like releasing into this nebulousness and um, trying to create from like an unknown nebulous place. I have here a quest. What do I truly desire? Uh, maybe being too, maybe even being too hard or critical in the face of inarticulable answers. And that's something I think we can kind of release ourselves from self-criticism. You know, like we don't have to have answers. We can feel into the bodily. We can ride the waves of the Piscean creative unknown and just abandon the need for answers. You know, Mercury under the sun's beams, solar eclipse, and just abandon it. Even, even the Mar Mars being in its water domicile, that's not a uh, outer energetic. It's an inner domicile. That's the inner energy for Mars. And, it, and it's a feeling energy. You know, and so it's like feeling into things now and not looking for concrete intellectual answers as a major, major, major theme. Let me see here. I want to skip ahead um, and just move on because I think I talked a lot about that Venus stuff earlier and it really was profound. All, I'll, all I want to say here is that there's this artist that when I was thinking about the Venus and Virgo opposite Saturn and Pisces as the two rulers of the eclipse, what, what came to mind? It's this. It is uh, ya Yaoi uh, Kasami, um, Infinity Mirrors, the infinity mirrored room, the souls of millions of light years away. And this is, look at that. Isn't that Pisces? First of all, where is reality? There's just an unknown. Uh, you can't find the border or boundary. Look at the little write up here. This is from high.org. I think this is a, um, this is an art a museum, I believe in Britain. Um, I could be wrong about that, but you have here, the visitor becomes integral to this work as his or her body, that's Virgo, activates the environment, you know, Venus and Virgo, while simultaneously vanishing into the infinite space. That's the Saturn and Pisces, the opposition. If you've ever been in an infinity mirror or a mini mirrored room, it's like, whoa, you, 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 you do lose a sense of self. And you, you have to kind of release into this sort of unknown space. And so continuing her exploration of the transience of life, I thought, and the inevitability of death, that's heavy duty, I know, with Pluto square the lunar nodes and this being a Ketu eclipse, that's heavy duty with the themes we've already talked about. But I do think there, you know, what does she say here? Uh, this installation creates a harmonious and quiet place for visitors to contemplate their existence, reflect on the passage of time and think about their relationship to the outer world. And it's just, again, I think it's perfect for these very nonverbal as, uh, you know, uh, in, in certain ways. I know Mercury rules Virgo, but it's very much more of an attentiveness, I think, than an out, than maybe a, a going to find people to tell people about things. It's like a bodily attentiveness. And then, of course, Pisces is just like the release into the creative unknowns. It's James Joyce, Mercury and Pisces. Try to read Finnegan's Wake. I mean, that's what Pisces, I think, is ultimately uh, like, of course, a masterpiece. But all right. So let's come here. Thank you for the uh, search suggestion. I realize there is a difference. Just wondered if people used elements of the literal sky in their practices. Love from the Seattle suburbs. Yes, they do, Tara. Uh, in, at least in tropical astrology, what you, we do is we project... Um, some, one of the main ways people do that is every fixed star can be projected using spherical trigonometry to a degree position on the ecliptic. And so, for example, um, if you just look at what's a good example, like Regulus. So Regulus is the heart of the lion, Leo. That's in Virgo right now because of precession. And so you, 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 the, these, the constellations have meaning, very powerful meaning. And in these tropical systems, we do something called projected ecliptic fixed star conjunctions um, with planets. There's also something called parents, parent, parentella, I think is the pronunciation there, but they use fixed stars in a different way using angularity and local space and latitudes. But yes, we do use those. It's just, they're not about the signs, the 30 degree division where the planets rule, um, the segments that planets rule. It's about uh, other symbolic injections into planets through this, like I said, per, per, uh, spherical trigonometry. Okay, so let's shift here. And I wanted to come to the next chart, um, which is, oh no, this is the quote from uh, Beth. 
and I, I wonder if you were here, Beth, I think you may have been, but if you go to the Wikipedia page for um, uh, uh, Kasami, uh, the artist, you can read this quote, it's there. I followed the thread of art and somehow discovered a path that would allow me to live. And I just thought that was so beautiful for this moment. Cause it's like, what's going on? You know, it's so insane. And it's Virgo. You look at a little thread and you go, okay. And you pull the thread or you follow the thread. That's the Virgoan precision. You're following that thread and it's art, the thread of art, the thread of Venus, Venus and Virgo. And that that path somehow opens up in this moment, this whole moment. I think Venus is the secret to this eclipse moment. I mean, obviously it's the domicile ruler of Libra, but it rules everything. And this Venus and Virgo special way of like this bodily attentiveness and following threads. I think it's just a perfect way. And I think Saturn and Pisces really is about finding a reason to live. I mean, I don't mean to give you too heavy here, okay, everyone. It's just astrology is heavy. Life's heavy. Sometimes we have to be heavy. And Saturn is grief. It's grief. that You pick up Vedius Valens, go to the ancient texts, all the old ones. Saturn means sadness, grief, loss. And Pisces is deeper, profound wisdom, the Jupiterian, you know, uh, revelation. And so I do really, I do think with the opposition, again, let's go back and um, just to the chart, the opposition, this is following the thread of our art. And then we meet through that thread, we have to confront the grief and sadness and the depth of the truth of our beingness. And that and oppositions are beautiful. They're there. I love it because it forces us to balance, we, we have to learn how to do Saturn and Pisces sometimes. And if we go too far, we get actually we can modulate it with the opposite. And so I think it's this really delicate creating to celebrate life and to, to, to sing our grief. You know, there's so many songs, beautiful gospel song. I saw the light. It's one of my favorite songs by Hank Williams. It's all about grief, you know, and then coming to the light and no more uh, uh, darkness, no more. Uh, what is it? I saw the light, no more sadness, no more strife or something. Um, and so this is what I think this moment is really very much about. And I really appreciate uh, finding that quote and mentioning it there, uh, Beth. Um, and so appreciate that on, on X Twitter. There is there there she is, uh, Kasama, the artist. Look how cool her uh, Venus and Virgo, her Venusian powers are. I pulled up her nativity. I always do this. Like I'll, I'll, I'll find something that matches the astrology of the moment. And then I'll go back to find the nativity of the person sometimes to say, Let's see if it's lining up with the theme. Look at this chart. Born on 22 March, 1929. She's still alive. This is the sunrise chart. She's got Mercury and Pisces. So we are, that's close to where Saturn is now. She's got Jupiter and Taurus, right three degrees from where Jupiter is now. That Mercury is bonified by the two benefics. Look how creative that is. The exaltation lords and the domicile lord and the exaltation lord of Pisces are bonifying Mercury. She's got the sun at zero Aries. That's where Saturn and Neptune are going to conjoin in 2026. Maybe if she's born later in the day, it might've moved off that. She's got Saturn and Cap, um, Leo moon. You can really feel that Leo moon, right? But it's this creative energy. It's all about Venus ruled stuff, you know? And so I just wanted to bring that in. I thought the chart really accentuated well the creativity of the Taurus Piscean exchange that we have in the current sky. And we also have an Earth Venus and so remember in this moment, it's 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 Virgo, Venus, Trine, Jupiter, Taurus. In her chart, they're conjoined. And then they're sextiling a, a point here. It's Mercury uh, in early Pisces, but also trining Saturn. So we get that in our current chart, Saturn and Pisces. So go. anyhow, hope you followed that a little bit of quick astrology there. Just the point is the creativity. I feel like this chart can show us a way and her life and work can kind of show us a way. I really feel her Saturn mercury sextile when you read that description of infinity mirrors it's like you know grief and sadness the unknown the inevitability of death and we're here trying to find the self and the multiplicity of reality I mean, it's it's really tripped out of like saturn sextile uh, mercury and pisces okay let's push on uh we're now coming and closing down I always do an election everybody knows here at the end of my chats the election for the waxing pisces moon uh, phase, which is the phase that we're about to be in, or sorry, the, the waxing phase of this lunation is solar eclipse in Libra. Now the moon waxes into the lunar eclipse in Taurus. So that's the phase I'm looking at. And what I always do in these uh, talks is just try to find, thank you, Alexis. I really appreciate that much love back to you. Uh, and 
Oh, I'm, I'm so happy to hear it. Um, Soul Bird's Nest, you know, the suppressed art, you know, I feel like creativity is so fundamental to uh, our humanity. I mean, everybody has a fifth house is another way to say that. That's why astrology is so beautiful. And the houses and the topics in the houses are so profound often because, you know, the, the idea is that every, the houses contain all the topics of life and everybody has every house, you know? And so we all have our creativity somewhere. I feel like it's fundamental when you look at the relationship between the first house ninth house and the fifth and so in everybody's whole sign chart there will be the same element and i i view these as like the spiritual generative spiritual houses it's self it is a god that's the ninth house or spirituality or if you're maybe atheistic it could be more the nature of reality and then it's what we generate it's self the generation the nature of reality and so I just love that we can all sometimes enjoy creativity because, you know, every, you know, just writing, really speaking or writing every day, we're always creating in some way. So, okay. And Saturn MC cap. Yes. But this is, remember that is um, a solar chart. So that chart is important, but it's not an official birth time, but it certainly is one uh, metaphor for that moment. Vedic systems have, they use that solar chart. They, that's one of the charts they look at. So certainly in the solar chart, it's that Saturn MC conjunction. And that's profound because it's exactly a sun. Oh, sorry, let me just go back to her chart because that was what that comment was about. You can see here Saturn ascendant, Sa uh, sorry, sun ascendant, Saturn MC, both very powerful, uh, exalted sun, domiciled Saturn. I mean, so much power in her chart. And she's a powerful woman. You can see, I mean, just look at, you know, she's very well known, one of the most important artists alive. But look at that power. Look at that. I mean, it's just so beautiful. Look at the Leo moon. <laughs> Doesn't it come through? Isn't it cool how sometimes I think Leo is one of the most signs where you can see it often with folks. There's like the red, the fire, the hair, all of it. Okay, where I got where I am, guys are cheering on a goal, a big soccer match here. Um, I don't know if you could hear that, but okay. Let me see. Um, let me go next. So the election, let me just come into the election. It's the waxing. So here's the sun. Now, remember, I said the sun enters Scorpio on the 23rd of October. This is two days after the sun has entered Scorpio. You have that Scorpio stellium. And but the moon is now sent out trining that Scorpio stellium and Pisces. It's kind of a hard waxing phase, you know, because it, you know, everything is going to be either the moon will either be with Mars. I know it's a strong Mars, but sometimes that can just be rough for the moon in Scorpio. Then you have the moon squaring Saturn by sign. Then you have the moon detriment. Then you have the moon squaring Mars. Then you have the moon conjoined Saturn. Then you have the moon angular, angular to the lunar nodes. It's kind of a rough, there's a rough patches here. It's hard to find a really strong moon right now. When this happens, what I like to do is just wait for the moon to be separating from any of the malefic energies like it is in this chart and then try to get it applying to benefic energies so this uh moon was carrying the light of of um jupiter the, the thing about this moon on the 25th of october is this actually is a true bona fide moon and a lot, one of my couple of videos ago I, I missed a, a breaking up of a ray of mars but i double checked and triple checked this one this is actually a true lovely bona fide moon where you have it separating from Jupiter, the sextile, and then applying to Venus. And everything I said earlier, this whole talk earlier, we were talking about the Piscean, the Virgoan, and then the Earth, Jupiter, and the creative, and the bodily, the bodily, the way the body expresses the art. I mean, music comes from the body. I'll say this now. I mean, you hear a, a voice live, uh, opera, you hear a, a good busker, you sing if you've got friends you're like um you're harmonizing or just singing with people there's something that it's kind of the most beautiful music in my opinion it's better than the digital stuff that comes through the systems it's better than almost anything else that like that's how they used to do it in you know pre-amplified world for sure but you would have little groups and dinner parties you would bring the quartet and they would play the music or you would bring the you know you know, the jazz musicians, and it was all kind of more localized how music was delivered. So I think there's something powerful here with, um, again, the moon is the ruler by night of all earth signs. The moon is the body. The moon is the exaltation ruler of Taurus. And you have the moon in, in bonafide here in this dreamy, imaginative Pisces ruled by Jupiter and ruled by Venus. And so is there, it's all about creating in the body, feeling in the truth of the wisdom in the body. Okay, let me come back here. 
Um, what do I have written down here? A dreamy creative realm offering solace through liminality. That's another idea here that the liminal is instead of viewing liminality, which is just the space in between. It's perfect for mutable signs as a terminology, mutable moon and Pisces. Sometimes we can actually look at the benefits of being in between in a transition and realize, hey, what's so cool about a transition is that you get to be excited about where you'll land, the new, the newness of the initiation of the cardinal on the one hand. And on the other hand, you can kind of say goodbye and appreciate what's gone before. And you're in, and it, the transition is this space where you're not yet the new obligations of the new cardinality aren't burdening us yet. <laughs> and that, that's one way to think about it. You know, once a real cardinal transit hits, it's like, there you go. There's no time to, to spend time in the, like a dream realm. And so I think there's benefits, the solace of the liminality and the creativity that I mentioned earlier. The one last slide I wanted to come to. Um, and so, uh, or actually, I'll say that in a second, but I like Dane Rudger. Everybody knows who's followed me for a while. Let me see here. Let me read a few more comments. Amazing made it. Okay, perfect. Um, Jupiter changed my fifth house now. Wonderful. Beautiful for the creativity. Love it. Did I miss Mercury, Kazemi, and Eretic? Um, that hasn't happened. Mercury has not been, uh, there was a inferior conjunction of Mercury and Virgo, what was that like last month um, or, or the month before? I think it was last month in September. We'll have a superior conjunction of Mercury in November, I believe. So look for that later. Um, you'd love Nightingale by Yanni. Okay, I'll, I'll try that. I'm going to throw that on uh, later um, and just kind of get into it. Thank you for that recommendation. I think Nightingale, perfect. The, the night signs. You know, Pisces is a night sign. Taurus is a night sign. Uh, Virgo is a night sign. Let's go back to the chart. And that's what we're accentuating with this election. Night, night, night. And often we sing at night. That's the time you, you go work during the day. You come back at night and do the music and the dance and the sing, singing. So I love that. I think that's a really appropriate nighting, uh, the idea of a, a night bird that can sing at night. Okay, let's come back. Pulse of Life, Dane Rud Rudyard. What does he say about Pisces? You can find this online. Uh, the Rudyard Archival Project. It's kind of controversial. I think there's wars over his uh, intellectual property, but I'm grateful for this site because it has to, my two favorite Rudyard books, The Pulse of Life and New Mansions for New Men. Um, those are my favorite core Rudyard. But what does he say about Pisces? He says here, transcendence, overcoming, piercing through illusions of false security. Doesn't that hit home? You know, it's like things have been pretty secure in our world for a lot of places. And what if there's a any I don't want to get too much into that mundane. Look at that talk on November 1st. I mean, we may be entering a more dynamic time in history. And I think it's good to just appreciate whatever security you have out there when there's people in the world right now that don't have that, you know, and that are really struggling with that. There's kind of a real gratitude for every moment and everything, you know, that we have a severance of social ties. That sounds like a Libra solar eclipse. He's talking about Pisces, embarking for the great adventure with utter faith and denuded simplicity of being. All these things are relate, uh, are to be learned in Pisces. Man is here to face to face. Man is here face to face with himself and with the greater self, which he names God. And I just love that. I think there's something about music and God right here in this moment, finding our uh, the foundation of Saturn and Pisces through the celebration of Venus. And if you're atheist out there, that's fine. God can just be, you know, the nature of reality. And you can have profound, you know, realizations about reality that can be grounding, even if someone doesn't have a more spiritualized view. I, of course, am very spiritual. I love the God concept. I don't have any problem with it. Um, so, okay, let me let me come back. But I don't want to um, uh, put that on anybody. So, okay, that's it. Uh, let me just make sure what did I, what did I have here. Um well, the last thing I want to say before I come to the, these closing slides, let's go back to the election chart. It's the land between eclipses, this famous thing called the land between eclipses. And, you know, we're in the liminal space of the land between eclipses. It's not just that Pisces is liminality and that um, Virgo is liminality. It's that we have one eclipse and another eclipse. You know, we're not out of the woods. You know, this has clearly been a peak solar eclipse moment. And I know a lot of people out there are talking about it in their lives, uh, but we have enough, you know, sometimes that second eclipse can bring the peak, you know. And so I encourage everybody during this phase of the lunation, the waxing phase, really uh, get psychic dreams. I have here a psychic dreams metamorph metamorphosis metamorph into psychic manifestations. I mean, you might have all kinds of messages, symbolic messages, 
you know, messages through the music. I'm already seeing that a lot. Like someone, I hear a song or someone's recommending a song and there's just a lot of synchronicity happening right now in my life. Even on X, I'm posting about that artist and then other people are commenting and posting. It's sort of all building here. I'm just sort of saying yes to being a participant. I really I think we can be open to like this side of life, particularly in the land between eclipses, which is kind of a Piscean, doubling up with the Piscean themes. I have here the mystical interim, enabling proximity to the divine and the subconscious, uh, using the unique astrological window for introspective journeying and understanding. And so these are the kind of themes I just want to remind us with, we're not, you know, eclipse seasonal end, we'll have that lunar eclipse on the 28th. It really is that new moon in Scorpio, or is it 17th, I believe, or 14th, I think, of November, that that's the first new kickoff of a new moon to kick off a new lunation after eclipse season. And I'll be breaking it all down. Probably I'm going to be doing lives on these, I think, now. So I hope to uh, see you for those. Um, okay, let's close this down. I want to remind us, uh, sjanderson144.com. Go to my website, schedule an astrology reading. Uh, my schedule is there. I know there's it's long a few months down the route, uh, uh, line when I have availability. Uh, but, you know, I hope you can find something that might work for you. You can always check where the planets are. Look at that all earth and water and then that air no fire right now i'm about to go tweet it tweet this out no fire right now it's important to understand um if the passions are kind of i guess the fire planet mars is so strong that gives us some fire but all right uh one thing i want to mention to everyone out there i'm doing a new forecast show uh, i don't know if some of you saw this but my friend dan waits good friend dan uh he's got a youtube channel world astrology report it's an awesome channel dan's amazing and um He's got awesome videos. I've been lucky enough to get to collaborate with him for a while. And we're doing every month now. We have a forecast show. We're working with another astrologer named Steph Koifman. She's an amazing astro. You've probably seen her, uh, you know, in, on the scene. But look for uh, uh, look for it. We're going to drop another one. Check this one out if you haven't seen it. We talk about just our, a lot of these themes. Um, and then we'll have something coming out towards the end of October for about November. And so... You know, I just appreciate you. Let's see, MT, thank you for this live SJ. Things have been challenging, but I've been getting more art done. Good, good. Glad to hear it. Art, rely on art. Maybe that's the main theme. I'm glad I did this too, because I, I didn't, I never even know what will happen when, you know, when you start talking about this stuff, I prepare things, but something changed for me, even as I was describing this astrology of how important the art is right now. I just, that's like, to me, the number one salve and the number one way through this, if we can make it is using our powers of creativity that, that it's that quote the th pulling the thread of creativity let's go back to it let's just read it one more time how beautiful that quote is thank you again beth uh i followed the thread of art and somehow discovered a path that would allow me to live how powerful how heavy is that first of all how heavy is that because 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 existential crises that's part of our beingness you know it's a, it's not an end we're it's always living we're never stop and so we always have to say, like, what is this? What's what's the reason? And I think that the creative powers, and it's not just like a, you're, we're a successful gallery artist or something like this. I mean, we have art, the art of, you know, opening the water bottle, you know, drinking the water. You know, everything's a kind of art. And this might be where you come back to some of those Zen ideas of like um, the art and the just the every day, every day, every moment. Everything can be an art, the art of living, you know, you might extend that even if we all don't have maybe the, the Kusama, the talent of Kusama or the that's not our path. Remember her chart. It's all that Taurus Pisces, very much an artist chart. But OK, so uh, check out the, yeah these videos I'm doing with Dan and um, thank you. I appreciate. Yeah, Steph is amazing on Venus. She the thing Dan and I kind of are, you know, we've worked together, but Steph is, has, is bringing an amazing, she's just an awesome astrologer. I love that I get to, you know, be associated and, and collaborate with her right now. Um, I needed to be reminded of this. Thank you. Okay. I'm very welcome. All right. I'm going to peace out. Everyone have a lovely, lovely eclipse, you know, hold on to your hearts, love yourself, create, just put on the music you like and lay down if you need to, and just have a lovely, lovely time. Okay. Peace. Thank you all. And I'll talk to you real soon. Okay. Bye-bye.